As a species, humans are incredibly smart. We tell stories, create magnificent art and astounding technology, build cities, and explore space. We haven't been around nearly as long as many other species, but in many respects, we've accomplished more than any have before us. We eat them, and they don't eat us. We even run scientific studies on them and are thinking about recreating some of those that have gone extinct. But our intelligence comes with a curious caveat. Our babies are among the dumbest, or rather, the most helpless that exist. A baby giraffe can stand within an hour of birth and can even potentially flee predators on its first day of life. A monkey can grasp its mother and hang on for protection and nourishment. A human infant can't even hold up its own head. One reason human babies are so helpless is that they're born with relatively big brains. We'll see how that affects helplessness in a moment. Mammals that are 130 LBEs typically have a brain that's an average of 12 cubic inches. In contrast, the brains of early humans were 36 cubic inches. Today, our average brain size is 73, 85 cubic inches, and the brains of Neanderthals were even bigger than ours. Our theory is that there is a kind of self-reinforcing cycle where big brains lead to very premature offspring and premature offspring lead to parents having to have big brains. What our formal modeling work shows is that those dynamics can result in runaway pressure for extremely intelligent parents and extremely premature offspring," said Piantadosi. In other words, because humans have relatively big brains, their infants must be born early in development while their heads are still small enough to ensure a safe delivery. Early birth, though, means that human infants are helpless for much longer than other primates, and such vulnerable infants require intelligent parents. As a result, selective pressures for large brains and early birth can become self-reinforcing, potentially creating species like humans with qualitatively different cognitive abilities than other animals. When animals produce self-sufficient young, it's for a number of reasons related to both biology and behavior. According to John Dumbacher, a curator of ornithology and mammalogy at the California Academy of Sciences. Some animals need their young to be mobile as quickly as possible in water or on land because adults are constantly on the move and the young need to keep up. Other species that don't roam as widely hunker down with helpless young in their nests or burrows. Take birds, for example. Songbirds, robins, bluebirds, those tend to be born more or less naked with their eyes closed, and they can't do much more than lifting up their heads and getting a meal from their parents, Dumbacher told Live Science. Newly hatched chickens, on the other hand, are much more capable of taking care of themselves. They have downy feathers, they can walk around, they can peck at the ground, Dumbacher said. And ducks, he added, can hop into the water shortly after hatching and swim after their mother. The variety in the hatchling's ability can be partly explained by the size of the adult bird, Dumbacher said, which translates into the maximum size of the egg it can lay. There is similar variability in mammals, Dumbacher said. Although all mammal newborns are dependent on their mothers for nutrition, some are more physically capable as newborns than others. Foals can stand up and walk independently soon after birth because adult female horses are big enough and can gestate long enough for their young to develop substantially before birth making them more physically capable even as newborns," Dumbaker explained. Physical and metabolic limitations also apply to human gestation and birth, according to a study published in 2012. It was already known that the brains and skulls of developing babies can't grow bigger than they do in the womb because they wouldn't fit through the mother's pelvis. The study found that a nine-month gestation period is likely the longest that a woman could safely sustain the accelerated metabolic rate required during pregnancy. But self-sufficiency of mammal newborns is dependent on more than a species size and metabolic rate, Dumacher added. It's also determined by the ecology of the species and how much of their behavior can be coded in instinct versus how much has to be learned from their parents, he said. The evolution of human intelligence isn't something that Celeste Kidd had ever pondered, a developmental cognitive scientist who currently works at the University of Rochester, her work had focused mostly on learning and decision-making in children. Over years of observing young children, she became impressed with the average child's level of sophistication. But when she looked at the infants she encountered, she saw a baffling degree of helplessness. How could they be so incompetent one second and so bright so soon thereafter? One day, she posed the question to her colleague, Stephen Piantadosi. Humans become so intelligent because human infants are so incredibly helpless, they argue. The one necessitates the other. 
The theory is startling, but it isn't entirely new. Researchers have been pondering the peculiarities of our birth and its evolutionary significance for quite some time. This means that infants must grow to a mature enough state inside the body to be born, but they can't be so big that they are unable to come out. This leads to a trade-off. The more intelligent an animal is, the larger its head generally is. But the birth canal imposes an upper limit on just how large that head can be before it gets stuck. The brain, therefore, must keep maturing, and the head must continue growing long after birth. The more intelligent an animal will eventually be, the more relatively immature its brain is at birth. Researchers have long known about this trade-off and about the connection between brain size and neural density and intelligence. For instance, Robin Dunbar found that the ratio of neocortical volume to brain size can predict the social group size in a number of species, including bats, cetaceans, and primates, while Simon Reeder has demonstrated links in tool use and innovation to brain size in primates. Kidd and Piantadosi's new idea is that increased helplessness in newborns mandates increased intelligence in parents and that a runaway selection dynamic can account for both. Natural selection favors humans with large brains because those humans tend to be smarter. During their investigation, Kidd and Piantadosi realized something important that strengthened their theory. It turns out that another variable has an even higher correlation with intelligence than brain size time to maturity or weaning time. In other words, the time it takes to shepherd newborns through absolute helplessness to a point of relative self-sufficiency predicts primate intelligence more strongly than the best measure that has previously been proposed, namely head circumference. Orangutans have smarter babies than baboons and they wean them longer. Baboon babies in turn are weaned longer and are smarter than lemur babies. Putting these facts together helped Kidd and Piantadosi develop their hypothesis. The connection between head size and intelligence does create incentives for babies to arrive earlier, but it's the connection between weaning time and intelligence that may really be driving the cycle. You need to be smarter to care for more helpless creatures, which means you need a larger brain which means that babies have to enter the world at an even more helpless stage of development since there is a finite size to their brain at birth, mandated by the physiology of live birth. And so the cycle continues. Of course, the theory is just that, a model. Ideally, to prove it, you would look at head size, birth time, and intelligence over the span of human evolution to see if we were born earlier as we got smarter. Data that are unavailable, but there are some intriguing converging pieces of evidence. For one, other animals that are not viviparous have not evolved the same levels of intelligence, suggesting an inherent link between live birth and brain power. And in modern humans, a few pieces of evidence appear to suggest that smarter parents are more likely to have offspring that survive. In one limited sample, maternal IQ and child mortality were negatively correlated, even controlling for education, age, and a number of other factors. In a larger sample of Californian parents, in 1,978 years of education were linked to infant mortality rates. Global epidemiological studies suggest a decrease in mortality that equals between 7 and 9% for each year of a mother's education. None of this is decisive, of course, but it is suggestive. There is, of course, one follow-up question. Why did this cycle happen to humans and not to lemurs? When I asked Kid about this, she told me that their theory cannot offer an answer likely as not. It's a matter of pure genetic luck that became self-reinforcing. As we grew smarter, we were better able to take care of our infants so they could be born more helpless and allow us to grow even smarter. Let's meet in the comments what you think about this. We hope you found our research both informative and thought-provoking. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more fascinating content. Don't forget to press the notification bell to stay updated with our latest uploads. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring. Goodbye.